Hello, I'm Glenn Thompson, and a warm welcome to TV Cruise Channel's First Time Guide to Cruising. Now, every year, a record number of British holidaymakers are choosing to take a cruise over a land-based getaway. And over the next half an hour, we're going to go back to basics, if you like. And if you're like me, new to cruising, sit back, relax. And I'm joined by the guru himself, travel guru Simon Calder. Nice to see you, Simon, who's going to help break down the most common questions about taking your first cruise. Simon, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us again today. My pleasure. Why is cruising becoming so popular then? It really is now, isn't it? It's a, a range of all sorts of factors, but I put it down basically to price. Increasingly, it's very competitive with other uh, family holidays. Ease, which just means that you only have to unpack once. Um, and the fact that it does seem to meet lots of needs, whether that's for adults wanting a bit of quality time on their own, um, to children who just want to have fun. A few years ago, more than a few years ago, cruising was seen for people with lots of money. It was for the money, yeah. wasn't it? They would take the cruise holidays and we'd go off on a little package holidays to Spain or wherever. Yeah, and uh, something quite revolutionary happened in the uh, mid-1990s. A uh, package holiday company suddenly said, we're going to get a cruise ship. We're going to start offering cruises for the same sorts of prices that you're paying for package holidays. And we'll take you around the Canaries for a week. And that absolutely transformed the offering. It made it possible. Um, and of course, the other cruise lines, existing ones, had to respond uh, for people to go off and have a, a week on a cruise ship flying into maybe somewhere like Palma in Mallorca, uh, maybe to Tenerife um, for you know, something under £500. Um, and that, of course, included all your uh, food on board the uh, vessel. So it suddenly transformed the economics. And since then, we've seen increased competition, plus the huge scale that we're increasingly seeing in, uh, in, in cruise ships, driving down the cost and making it um, really a very attractive option. So I'm new to cruising, very new to cruising. Um, what's included? Is it like an all-inclusive deal? It's subtly different from what you'd find in a land-based all-inclusive. Well, I say subtly, maybe not that subtle. Mm. Uh, you can eat 24 hours a day if you want to, um, but drinks are generally not included unless you've paid for a kind of all-inclusive drinks upgrade. Um, most of the activities on board, whether that's port lectures from people who are going to tell you about the places that are coming up in the itinerary to the show that uh, traditionally may be performed twice in an evening, mm. once an early uh, early show and then a later show. Uh, those will be included, but things such as spa treatments won't be. And of course, there's other things to spend your money on board, like uh, shops, casinos and, and so on. And um, you know, if you do like a, to, to have a drink when you're on holiday, then that will that could make a bit of a dent in your budget um, unless you mm. bought one of the all inclusive drinks packages. And of course, there's those tips as well. I mentioned mm, just now, yeah. Simon, at the top of the show that, um, you know, cruises a number of years ago were for people with money. The other thing that everybody thought about when you mentioned cruises, oh, it's for the older generation, it's the old folk, it's for Grandma, grandpa. Yeah. That's not the case now, is it? Uh, well, it, in, in a sense, uh, with the cruise industry expanding relentlessly, as it has been doing for the last couple of decades, um, building more and more bigger and bigger ships, um, they've got to expand the market. And the best way to do that, of course, is to uh, uh, target younger people. And in order to do that, you've got to put on uh, maybe uh, shows that um, have more appeal for, for, for younger people. Um, and you've also got to change the kind of whole atmosphere on board. And I must say the uh, predominantly American ships, I think, are best at doing this. You know, it, it, it is uh, a little bit younger, a little bit more edgy. And that that seems to be very popular with uh, <laughs> uh, with the target audience. When you say edgy, what do you mean? Oh, just <laughs> yeah, you you will actually get um, some really quite uh, good uh, rock and roll covers bands okay. doing some you know, re really really good uh, good good stuff fa fairly late at night, and uh, you know it is it is turning the place into a party ship rather mm. than, you know, at uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night, everyone you know, has, has one final brandy and then goes to Not sleep. Bed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and of course, there's um, an ever expanding range of excursions, which will increasingly appeal to, to younger people as well. People assume and think that uh, cruising is, is, is regimented. You're told what to do. You know, at five o'clock, you've got to go and have tea. Yeah. Seven o'clock, you meet the captain. Yeah. Is it like that? Well, that's a really good question, Glenn. So um, 
every day or every evening we'll get a schedule of events for the following day and it's I guess going back to kind of naval tradition you have to keep to time um, because <laughs> It's a ship. It's you know there's a limited number of, uh, uh, of of staff on board, and therefore things have to happen at a lim limited range of facilities. Things have have to happen when they're supposed to happen, mm. and it's always traditionally been the case that uh, you go for dinner. You're either early sitting or late sitting. Now increasingly, you're getting any time dining, which gives you quite a lot more flexibility. You don't need to say six months ahead. Oh, I think I'll have my dinner at um, half past six every evening or half past eight every evening. You can just decide on the day which appeals to a lot of people but yeah you've got to, you've got to keep your wits about you if you're going to partake of the uh, many options on board okay and it is a question of checking out the options isn't it? when you when you're at that early stage of booking what is included in my deal here because there are so many vast deals out there now, aren't there yeah and and uh, when, when you're planning your trip I tend to start with the uh, destinations because um, from my point of view, not necessarily from my family's point of view, but from my point of view, I just want to go to new and exciting locations and to be able to explore them with the great benefit of not uh, having to you know, make a, a special trip. So this is particularly the case maybe around the Caribbean. You've got lots of islands to go to, um, various ports around the Mediterranean, where you can go there, spend a day, enjoy yourself and get back on the ship. Uh, you also need to know, by the way, how you're going to get from the ship to the place you want to be. So, for example, Rome, that you've got this lovely place, Civita Vecchia, Port of Rome. It Say says. that again. Civita Vecchia. Lovely. Um, thank you. I've uh, been practicing. Um, <laughs> Uh, it says Port of Rome, so you think that's great. You know, where's the Vatican? Um, but in fact, it's you know, well over an hour from the Italian capital. Um, and so you've got to you, you work out the destinations you want to go to, work out how close they are, and then make your decision, which is also going to be affected, of course, by the size of the ship and predominantly the price. It tends to be the bigger the ship, the lower the price, because you, of course, get economies of scale. Brings me on to my next question. You lead into it nicely there. I mean, passport. You need your passport, obviously, but when you're stopping at different ports on different islands, I'm guessing you do need the passport for that. Uh, generally, um, there is an accommodation with the immigration authorities at each location that if you've got a cruise card, and this would be the first thing you get, it's normally a barcoded card with your name on and uh, you, you'll have your picture taken and every time you get on or off the ship, they'll, they'll scan it and, and your lovely visage will pop up <laughs> on their screen and they'll let you off the ship and then they'll hopefully let you back on the ship again at the end of it. Um, and that for a lot of destinations is sufficient. Sometimes you will be told, actually, um, you've got to... Uh, uh, take your passport with you or take some form of identity just in case there's a check. And occasionally, and I'm thinking here of um, uh, Israel, mm. where they're quite fastidious about security, they will say, OK, we're going to um, tie up at the port. Now we're going to get the Israeli immigration authorities on board. They're going to go through checking every passport, maybe asking you a few questions before you're allowed to disembark. So it varies, but um, generally, once you got on, um, that's that you mm. can put your your passport in the drawer for the rest and of the and voyage. Leave it there yeah. for the rest of the trip. Trip. Okay. What about a visa? Will I need a visa? Oh, well, the great advantage for cruises is that it unlocks some parts of the world for which you would normally need to do quite a lot of hard work in terms of a visa. Um, the classic example is the beautiful city of St Petersburg. Mm. Now, I've been lucky enough to travel the length and breadth of Russia, and I can absolutely assure you, Glenn, that St. Petersburg is by a country mile the most beautiful part of that um, lovely nation. I was going to ask you, what is your favourite part of this? Uh, because it's a vast Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and um, uh, St. Petersburg is the best. Yeah. And hopefully people will go to St. Petersburg and they'll think, oh, I love this uh, strange and uh, wonderful nation and they'll want to explore more. But you won't know that till you try it a bit. Now, you can, if you want to, do a land-based trip to Russia and you can go to the uh, consulate and get fingerprinted and uh, do all that stuff and get a visa. Or you can just go on a Baltic cruise in which they will always build in a couple of uh, okay. days in St. Petersburg. And then as long as you leave the ship on an organised tour, uh, then you don't need a visa. And I've been on some of these organised tours and they basically just say, turn up here, 
at nine o'clock. We'll put you on a bus. We'll take you to Nevsky Prospekt, the main main street. We'll drop you off and we'll come back six hours later. So effectively, you've got the day to wander around mm. and explore. Mm. So um, with visas there, it's good. And I'll tell you what, some interesting things happening in China. Um, where previously it, everyone who went there had to get a visa, but they've just, for instance, in Shanghai, which I think is the prime uh, Chinese port, brought in a 144 hour visa and they've expanded it from just airline passengers to uh, cruise passengers as well. So you can typically fly into Shanghai, spend two or three days there. And as long as your ship is sailing directly to a third country, maybe Korea, maybe to Japan, you don't need a visa, which is saving you upwards of 150 pounds and a great deal of hassle okay all right um we'll be finding out how to pay for things on board oh. the ship yeah. very shortly very uh, but do stay with us we'll be back chatting more with simon in just a few minutes on cruising for beginners stay with us Hello, welcome back to TV Cruise Channel's first time guide to cruising. Travel guru Simon Calder still with me. We touched on just before the break there, Simon, paying for things on board. What's the best way to do it? Huh. Up front? Well, yes, you will almost certainly these days, and I'm trying to think if I can think of any ship in which this won't happen, you will be required to register a credit card. Even if you intend to settle at the end of the trip your, your bill with cash, they'll still say have a credit card. The, you will then, on your cruise card, be able to charge pretty much everything you want. So uh, you go and order a drink, they'll swipe your card and you will, um, uh, you, it will just appear on your, on your onboard bill. Much like when you check into a hotel, they take a swipe of your card, don't they? Yes, um, although it's surprising how quickly it builds up, not least mm. because they will quite often as well add on the tips along the way. Uh, yeah. um, the gratuities, as they're called, are part of um, uh, cruise life for an awful lot of cruise lines, mm. and they really mount up. Typically, £10 per person per day um, would be not at all unusual, and that is not quite mandatory. It is a tip. You can go and see them at the uh, reception desk and say, I don't want to pay that. I want to tip people individually. But um, it's generally assumed that you will be uh, tipping and they will be ordered, uh, added to your ship board account. Unless, of course, you've done what increasingly many people mm. do, which is pay for them in advance, which you might think is ridiculous. You know, how can I tip for good service if I haven't had the service yet? But that's the way that the cruise industry works. Are you warned about that pretty well up front, though, Simon, before you sign on the dotted line, if you like? You know, are you warned that tips might be added on to that well you, you should be and yeah. particularly if you're going through a good cruise agent they will certainly warn you but it's crucial when you're you're comparing different options to price mm. them up properly because most cruise lines will say yep we expect you to tip this much and you've really got to add that to the the bill other cruise companies will say tips are included or there's no need to leave any any further gratuities um, and you need to price that in as well, or rather not price it in, so that you're comparing properly like with like. But I must say bluntly, your tips are paying the wages yeah. of the people on board. Um, it's long since lost touch with the idea that you get exceptional service from someone and think, here you are, let me give them some money. Talking of currencies, by the way, almost everything on most ships is in um, US dollars. You might find on British based ships you pay in pounds you might find on europeans it's in euros but the us dollar is king on board most ships talking of money if your cruise takes in a number of different countries how do you get on with dealing with that currency situation do you take yeah. a lot of different currency with you well here's personally what i do i have a look at the itinerary if it includes places where the euro is the currency then i will certainly get some euros up front because Actually, anybody based in Britain can ahead of time get some pretty decent uh, prices on euros, certainly at a better rate than you would ever get by putting your debit card in a hole in the wall machine. Mm. Um, if you are looking at uh, uh, the US ports or indeed anywhere in the Caribbean, then it's going to be the US, US dollar. dollar. Again, you get those in advance. And if it's odd places, you know, maybe um croatia where the kuna is um is popular and uh, that's uh, that's the, the national currency and, and a port like uh, dubrovnik then i'll always change locally uh, don't change on board 
they all have their own special rates, <laughs> which are not necessarily to your advantage. Mm. Um, but as soon as you get off the ship in somewhere like um, Dubrovnik, there's places to change. Same applies in, in Turkey, in Egypt, anywhere which has so-called exotic currency. OK. Back on board then, Simon. Um, I'm booking my cruise. Accommodation, what's available? Yeah. Big question, I know. Oh, it's a great question. Um, everything is called a state room. Um, a state room? A state room. I would call it a cabin. OK. Um, very but regal. State, state room seems, <laughs> seems more grand. Um, yes. And of course, you get different like grades. Royalty. Yes, you, different <laughs> grades of, of, of cabins. I have um, uh, generally go for the um, inside cabin that means of course you don't get a porthole you certainly don't get a balcony mm. um, but you do get low prices um, and then it increases from there and uh, you're getting lots and lots of ships now which are pretty much all balcony and that can be a really really appealing thing particularly if you're sailing past land yes um, so maybe around the Mediterranean maybe around the Caribbean uh, and then at the top of the the tree you've got uh, much bigger spaces because um, you know a cabin is quite quite confined, um, but you've got things like uh, you know, the suites with with generally top of the tree the owner's suite, mm. which is probably with respect bigger than your house. Are we talking um, the difference in price then between an, an inside cabin, as you call it, and a porthole cabin? Is there a huge difference in price? Well, then? Uh, right. I reckon that you are getting a really good price for a cruise if you're paying seventy pounds per person per night. Uh, which translates pretty much as £500 a week. Um, and you would that's the sort of price you would pay for an inside cabin. Uh, for anything with a view of the sea, probably up £100. If you want a balcony, another 200 maybe. And then you know, the sky is the limit. Uh, and it's up to you entirely. I intend to spend as little time as possible in a, in cabin. a cabin. And so therefore, um, I'm very happy to pay for the... Uh, the, the lowest cost. OK, that brings us, if you don't want to be in the cabin and you're talking entertainment, that brings us nicely on to the entertainment mm. question. I mean, it depends again what cruise you go on, I guess. But the entertainment aspect of cruising is phenomenal. There's so yeah. much out there. Where do you start? Well, you start with your, your uh, timetable of what's happening on the cruise line on that particular day. And it can be um, anything, a magician, a conjurer, a hypnotist might be uh, doing a performance. There's generally one or two big shows a day, and those are using you know, pretty good, generally, um, singers, dancers, uh, entertainers on a big stage in what feels like a kind of fairly intimate, almost West End or Broadway experience, mm. depending, of course, on the scale of the ship. Um, and on top of that, you've got so much extra. You, you quite often will have um, individual musical ensembles, uh, you know, maybe somebody tinkling away on the piano by the bar. You might have um, maybe particularly on these bigger, newer ships where you've got a large atrium space, you might have a band playing in the middle of that. Lovely no end to the amount of entertainment well a lot of a lot of stars have made their start oh, of course cruises, yeah oh, many, it's a, 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 a great circuit to be on yeah. um, because of course you're, you're working so hard all the time and uh, you know it, it's a really good grounding entertainment is is colossal on board as we've discovered as we've established but uh, the other thing that's um, your sport for choice for is food isn't it where do you, you know, you've got this lovely layout of food. It's just phenomenal. Again, I guess it depends on the sort of cruise you're going on. Well, yeah, the, the, the common theme to all cruise ships that I've ever been on is that there is a pretty open, pretty unlimited buffet going on for pretty much most of the time from seven in the morning till 11 at night and outside those hours, don't panic. There's always somewhere you can get a bite to eat. Yes. Um, and the, the the buffet experience tends to be on one of the upper decks and it's, it's a big old area with lots and lots of um, options. That tends to be fine. And it would be, you know, I would normally pick up some breakfast there, a bit of fresh fruit. Um, they've got all the kind of usual breakfast suspects there. <laughs> um, but I'd prefer to grab a coffee and go and sit on the on, on deck. Um, but then in the evening, uh, the, it, everything kind of changes character and you've generally got one or two more formal um, restaurants, which mm. is great uh, because you are having this unusual experience where you're going out effectively to a, to a high class restaurant every night, but you've already paid for it. It's included in the, uh, in the price. And if you choose not to drink 
very much, then you're not actually going to increase the cost um, and you're going to be served very well prepared, very well served um, food. And that's good. And on top, uh, absolute top of the tree is the speciality restaurants. Now, this might be a kind of a named celebrity chef. Uh, it might be um, just a, a very good steakhouse. It's going to be a cut above what you would get as part of the normal thing, but you're going to be paying extra for it. Um, mm. Typically, I've just been on a cruise and we went out for a fantastic steak um, and that was an extra $59, so over £40 per person. Wow, and obviously mm. you go dressed accordingly, depending on the restaurant yeah. you're going into. The other thing, of course, Simon, is the sea air. I don't know about you, always gives me a good appetite. Uh, yes, absolutely. Before I walk along the beach, yeah. I feel hungry. <laughs> it, it, quite, quite, quite. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I'll tell you what, one of the most fascinating things you can do, and I've tried this, I think, on a celebrity cruise, they run a backstage tour, so you can go and have a look at the kitchens and find oh. out how it's done. Of course, it's an incredible work of choreography to bring all this food to you. OK, got about 30 seconds left. Very quickly, recommendations for first time cruises. To me, not having been on a cruise before, where would you send me? I would send you just across the channel. I would send you on the cheapest, most basic cruise where you're not going to invest huge amounts of time. You might not like it. You might think this is the best thing ever. What have I been missing? Um, just head across uh, maybe to Zeebrugge and you can visit the city of Bruges, maybe to Saint-Malo in, in uh, northern France, maybe to the Channel Islands, maybe even across to Cork. But uh, just a little weekend cruise, a couple of hundred pounds, see how you enjoy it. Simon Calder, thanks for joining us today. Cruising for beginners. Hopefully we've whetted your appetite. Thanks for watching. We'll see you here on TV Cruise Channel next time. Bye for now. Thank you.